Well, hello again, my dog training friends. So I got a question here from someone. And remember, if you have a question, you can always join Ask Jeff the Dog Trainer on Facebook. It's super easy to find it. You go to facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Ask Jeff the Dog Trainer. So this question says this. I have a large standard poodle, 15 months old. It's a good age. Uh, he's very food oriented. That's good. We like that. He has trouble calming down after a food game. Oh no. Uh, he wants to nip and jump again. Ah. Sometimes I go into another room and he will calm down. Is there any other way of handling the end of the game? He can seem disinterested in toys often. Well, I kind of already got an idea what's going on here because I was looking through some of the comments and it seems like. Uh, you know, this dog is still like grabbing on pants and uh, doing stuff like that or sweatshirts. Uh, and the vet said to distract him. So, you know, unfortunately, vets aren't dog trainers. And if there's any vets watching right now, I'm sorry. It's just the truth. Um, and maybe some of you are. I know there's a very uh, popular dog trainer I hear about who is a vet. Um, but I have a much different experience because I wasn't making my living operating on dogs. I was making my living on training them and oftentimes dealing with the whole, I mean, um, not so great advice that the vets would give my clients uh, before they were my clients, which led to them becoming my clients because they tried doing the stuff the vet said and it sometimes only made the dog worse, which some of the stuff I will recommend can absolutely make your dog worse because whenever you go to contradict uh, your dog, there's this chance they can contradict you back in the form of a nip, growl, bite, what, whatever you want to call it, or however that might pan out for you. So here's the deal. The whole redirect thing, I call that the redirection misconception. And the reason why is a very uh, interesting reason because, you know, everyone recommends that you should redirect bad dog behavior. And I'm a firm believer that you should absolutely not redirect bad dog behavior. And here's why. If you redirect bad dog behavior, it's like an okay win. It's like putting a Band-Aid, though, on a bullet wound where it's not exactly going to fix the problem up forever. Uh, so I was just getting reminded by Dawn to be nice to vets. A vet told me to drop off my business card. And that was probably like a year or two ago, and I still haven't done that. I've been a little busy uh, doing other things. Whoops. So, Don, let's have somebody do that. That's not me, hopefully. Uh, anyhow, because uh, sometimes if I focus in what I'm really great at, which is training dogs, and I let others focus on the things like dropping stuff off at vets, I'll be able to help a lot more people. So I try to avoid stuff like that, and that's why I haven't done it. Uh, even though a big part of me wants to drop everything I'm doing and just go do that right now, uh, even though they're closed now at this time of day. So anyhow, <laughs> the redirection thing, it sounds so great because it's like, hey, if your dog's doing something, just distract them. But here's what happens. Your dog's very smart. So when your dog is being bad, such as nipping at your plant pants or biting at your sweatshirt, and the idea is, well, I'm just going to distract them with this game. Well, of course, at the end of the game, they're going to go right back to nipping and biting and jumping on you, of course, because they think that's what led to the game. You following me? Because a lot of people play the games to redirect their dog's misbehavior. Now, I know this sounds uh, stupidly simplistic, and it's because it is, but it works like a charm. And if it didn't, I wouldn't be teaching it to you right now. But all you want to do is be on the forefront. So before your dog's nipping, jumping, biting, play the game then. Then don't stop playing the game until your dog has been fulfilled. Now, how will you know when your dog's been fulfilled? They're gonna go do something else. They're gonna want to go lay down. All right, more on this in a second. But even if they didn't, and you're just playing this game of the airplane thing, where I think it's when you're practicing heel, if I'm not mistaken, and they're looking at you and you just kind of toss them a treat. I could be dead wrong, but I'm just assuming it's where you have your hands out and they're looking at you. But when you're playing a game like that, of course, the dog's excited, right? They might even be jumping up a little bit to grab the food, uh, but they're definitely having fun. If they're not jumping, great. It means you're doing a very good job. But any sort of like crazy excitement there, I want to eat, I want to play, I want to eat, I want to play. Well, when the game stops, what do you think that dog's going to do? It's going to harass you. Come on, I want to eat, I want to play. But if you will, do it enough. And that's the key word here, enough. And the problem is most people don't realize how much work it actually takes 
to fulfill their dog's needs. And because we have fulfilled them, we've never got our dog to a place they need to recharge their battery. What we're doing is just like draining a little of the dog's energy and whoop, it pops right up. We drain a little bit of the energy and whoop, it's right back up. But if we were just to drain a little bit, drain a little bit, and drain a little bit more, your dog will get to a place they have to actually stop for a second, recharge their battery. Now, what does that look like? Well, that looks like a dog laying there. It looks like a dog, you know, hanging out, sitting down, not being functional and active at the moment, but just being like a doormat dog. So the way we create that is to literally drain that battery. Now, when you're playing a game like this, if it's an easy game and all they have to do is look at you and get a treat and follow you around, I mean, that's pretty easy. So it's not going to drain a whole lot of energy because like fun factor factors in, complexity level factors in. So the higher the fun factor, the lower the complexity, the longer it's going to take to drain the battery. But less of the fun factor, more complexity, although your dog's not going to enjoy it as much, well, that's why, then they're going to want to go do something else. They're going to want to get away from you. Now, the way to translate this in the human world is if you don't like math, and maybe you do, but if you didn't, and I were to go, hey, we're about to learn about quadra something equations. I don't even know a good word for that because I'm not that great at math. But, you know, we're going to study this thing that you have no idea what it is. And ready? I'm going to teach you. Now I'm going to ask you to do a quiz. Now I'm going to, you know, kind of get on you if you're not getting the answers. Now I'm going to re-quiz you. Now we're going to learn some new stuff about fractions. And now, you know, eventually you're like, dude, I don't want to learn. Like, please, like, leave me alone. Like, I'd rather sleep right now than have to deal with you. And I know this sounds kind of crazy, and this is an extreme way to get this information across. I'm not saying torture your dog with math. What I'm saying is look at the fun factor and the complexity and see what's going on there. Now, we, do we want the dogs to have fun? Heck yeah. But you might want to raise that complexity so even though it's fun, they're kind of like, okay, this is fun, but I need a break. My mind is exhausted. And sometimes it's as simple as adding some obedience during the airplane game that you might have to do a little prep work to get them to uh, if you're not a dog turning ninja yet. Uh, but let's say your dog could down, your dog could roll over, your dog could shake, your dog could speak. I don't know. Your dog, you know, I think you're saying your dog does the touch thing. Uh, let's add a couple more. Your dog goes to the place. Let's say it's another good one. Your dog like sits pretty or something, but you know, you have this repertoire of stuff. Well, you want to start working the brain. So when you're doing your airplane game, like out of nowhere, it's like, hey, dog, go to your bed. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Good. Go to bed. Okay, great. Now, by just sending the dog to the recharging port, uh, it's going to start to induce kind of this sleepiness because what happens is, is when you go from movement to not movement to movement to not movement, in that moment of lack of movement, like if you just put a human on the uh, a bed and put them in a dark room, uh, the tendency is most, not all, most will start to get a hair more sleepy than they were if they were standing up in a, a bright lit area, right? So simply by just having your dog sit put for a second here and there uh, starts to really help, even if it's just a minute or two at a time. Then uh, what I'll do is have them start playing the game again. And out of nowhere, I'm like, sit, right? And I'm cruising, I'm walking. And then I'm like, come, you know? And I'm like, all right, airplane. And then cool, okay, now I'll touch. And then, okay, great, back to the bed. And I give them again a little time to calm down. Does this make sense? And I'm making the bed fun because it's leading back to what they really want to do, which is the airplane game. So I start putting the things that maybe they're not as good at, which can even be a simple task, but if they're not good at it, it's complex to your dog. And by not good at it, I mean if you have to ask them to do it more than once, right? So to get them good at it, you want them to do it and get the answer the first time. Not like, hey, take this math quiz. Uh, what's two plus two? And the kid's like, three? And you're like, what's two plus two? They're like, four. And you're like, yeah, you got it right the second time. Well, not, not really good enough, right? That's not good enough for our human children. Why should it be good enough for our dogs? Talk to someone today on the phone, matter of fact, and they were recommended by uh, uh, Joanne with uh, Izzy Rose. I was just talking about Izzy Rose. So thank you, Joanne. I really appreciate that. It was a great conversation. I had a lot of fun talking to her. And one of the things she had mentioned was, you know, I'm doing all this stuff with my dog. And, you know, when I come to the stops, when I'm walking, you know, I'll say sit. And, you know, then I say it again, usually, and then my dog will sit. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine and dandy, but, you know, at some point, if we really want to teach our dogs not to do certain other behaviors, it helps to master the more simplistic things like sitting when you come to a stop. So I said, how about you ask sit once, and if your dog doesn't do it, you give some helps. And I coach you a little bit on how exactly to do that. But when it comes to this situation, for one, we definitely want to get rid of that misconception, uh, or I'm sorry, that redirection misconception. That's a no-go in my book. Now, if you have to because you have an aggressive dog or you have to because, you know, you don't know what else to do and your dog's just harassing you, well, sure. But you're much better off putting that dog in the crate 
letting that dog out of the crate and then starting the game, right? Uh, after a little downtime when they've already calmed down a hair. Uh, but then letting them out right into the game and then playing the game to your dog so not wanting to play anymore, aka sick of it, uh, that then they want to go do something else. Now, believe it or not, I've trained dogs and worked with clients where we've had a dog that had like eight gazillion toys around. They don't want to play with a single one. All they want to do is nip and jump on us. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to teach you chill pill dog. Ready? And the dog's like, okay, I don't really appreciate that game, chill pill, Jeff. I don't really like that one. How about I go get a toy? And everyone's like, whoa, mind blown. And it's because, you know, the dog was challenged. And it's like, well, okay, that's not really working out the way I want it. Let's go do something else. And so the way to get your dog to not want to harass you again is you have to disassociate harassing you leads to you trying to redirect with fun, treats, toys, whatever. You don't want to do that. I know the vets recommend it. I know all the, uh, a lot, I don't want to say all, a lot of internet dog trainers, a lot of actual dog trainers, they recommend that. I don't. Now, my track record uh, is pretty gosh darn good. Um, recently, though, I had a lady that was non-pleased with my service. Uh, I won't get too into that, but I was slightly and largely offended. But, you know, I'll get over it, I guess, eventually when I stop talking about it. Uh, but, you know, it's not for everyone. Not everyone's going to take action. Not everyone's going to understand uh, what it is I'm trying to demand from them, which is, look, if you want to change your dog's behavior, you've got to change your own. And there's certain behaviors that you're trying to change that it's not it's not a good idea to do that yet. You have to build a foundation before you can knock off your top item, right? Unless you're a super duper awesome uh, dog trainer and you have all day to try to knock off that thing on top because it's going to take more time than most people have. And if it's something like uh, dog reactivity and the only dogs you have to work with is like a neighbor's dog that's walking by and, you know, you try to interrupt that dog's behavior and then it tries to attack you, uh, you need to do a little more prep work. So no, uh, getting a quick result there is probably not going to happen under uh, the parameters given, which is, you know, hey, uh, let's use this cute little leash and harness or whatever, or whatever's going on there. And, you know, let's stop this dog by telling it no. Oh yeah, and it doesn't want treats. Cause I tell you what, redirecting that dog is a great first step, but that dog didn't want treats. You get what I'm throwing here? So it's like, you gotta do some prep work. You gotta get to the point your dog would choose a treat over reactivity before you can actually deal with the reactivity. Or, or, or you're gonna be dealing with a lot of that dog trying to, uh, if it already showed you that that's what its intention is, of it trying to attack you for interrupting that behavior. So anyhow, I'm going to get over that eventually. But uh, back on back on to good news. You know that very same uh, uh, day. Uh, you know we had a lot of positive uh, feedback from people that worked with me in person and also just strictly online. And we have plenty of ways where people can get help. Very similar to this. You know, you post a question in the group. I'll make a live video for you. Uh, but if someone wants to go a little deeper, of course. We have Canine Connect 360, which is really cool. You get to work with me every week on Thursday over Zoom. And we have some awesome members in the group, uh, some of which are also dog trainers. And the way it works is, you know, we celebrate your wins and then we figure out what you need to do next to hit your next goal. So it's a way to keep you motivated. Unlike me, I've wiggled out, I think, two days in a row now of my workout because I've been busy doing other things. Uh, but when you're accountable, when there's someone there showing up at your door, or in this case, you click the button, show up on the Zoom, well, now you're accountable. You're there. You know, All you really have to do is have enough courage then uh, to ask your question and get help. But it's a very easy going group. I think you'll get along just fine and, and be totally thrilled with the results. But um, with that being said, you know we have plenty of free videos just like this one. Uh, I try to help people as much as I can all the time, while, of course, uh, not trying to make my family too upset that I've lost the roof over our heads by being uh, too giving. So sometimes we do charge for stuff, too. Uh, but long story short, when the dog is going nuts and it's going crazy and it associates that behavior will equal a fun game or will equal us trying to throw them a toy or will equal us giving them the high value treat or will equal us taking them for a walk or will equal whatever that thing is. If it's something pleasant, 
that they enjoy, uh, they're probably just going to keep doing that thing to get the thing that they want. This would be very similar to a police officer pulling you over and giving you $100 bills. Uh, instead of being bad, although you might spend the $100 bills, and it might work for a second because you're not speeding, you actually pulled over, went to go spend your money, uh, maybe even if it was just pulling over as you Amazon stuff to your house, you know, think about it. Like you're probably going to repeat the bad behavior versus when you get the ticket, you know what that ticket equals. And so that alone is enough to make you not want to do it. But out of the two forms, because there's two that motivate human behavior, we have the escape of pain and the gaining of pleasure. And that's pretty much it. Now, the pain doesn't have to be physical. It could be emotional, mental, right? Think about it. When a spouse threatens to leave, if that spouse wants them to stay, uh, that's painful, right? Sure is. If it's ever happened to you, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It could be pretty painful. Even if they stay, just the fact they threatened it could be pretty painful. And you might want to escape that by doing what they asked or by finding a compromise on the thing that made them mad in the first place to make them want to leave unless it was just they found someone better. In which case, step your game up. Come on, let's go. Now, maybe that's not always the case. Maybe someone just vibed better with someone else. Okay, but uh, in all reality, you know, for a relationship to work, you have to work it. Okay, it takes work on both sides typically. But if one person was just super giving, of course, that would work for both. And that's the way it usually is with our dogs. We do all the work. And, you know, it gets us by because we're constantly give, 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 so they don't bite us too much. Uh, but as soon as we stop giving, of course, now they're going to start complaining because that's the way we've set up our relationship. So the way I like to teach people to set the relationship is, you know, when you're calm, you're going to get cuddles. When you're calm, you're going to get to be excited. When you're calm, you're going to get the treats. When you're calm, we will play the games. But the condition is being calm. Now, believe it or not, again, stupidly simplistic, then the dog defaults to being calm. I know, it's taking the wind out of my sails too because it's way too easy. And what most of us are looking for is a complex answer. Now, what do you have to do in order to create that? There's tons of things you can do. Uh, but one of our members uh, on K9 Connect 360 mentioned last night, his name's Scott. And uh, Scott is a totally awesome guy, by the way. I really love Scott. And me and him both like M&Ms a lot. But anyhow, uh, one of the things he had mentioned is we were helping someone in the group with jumping an issue. They had an issue with jumping. He had mentioned back tying. And, you know, I did not mention that. You know, I'd mentioned a lot of things. I certainly didn't mention that. And so back tying is a huge thing that will get you results. Like, it's crazy, but most people won't do it, right? There ain't nothing to it but to do it. I actually posted that today on my personal page because I really was feeling that as I was delving into some things that made me want to go to sleep because it's a little beyond my current level of comprehension. But you know what? When we're confused, that's usually the moment we're about to make that breakthrough because we start getting frustrated like, geez, I'm just not getting it. And if we keep going, we will. Because most humans, they'll quit within 5% of that goal. They're like right on the edge and then they give up. Uh, but I can tell you from my own experience, don't quit. You want to keep going. The only way you create traction is to take action, and that's what leads to the satisfaction. But if you, you know, start off and you get some momentum and quit, you're not going to get nowhere. And I know, like, for a lot of my clients, you know, it's been one session and, like, you know, reactive dog problem solved. But you know what? A lot of those people, they were willing to step up and do the things that most people weren't willing to do to get the results. Because a lot of people go, you know what? My husband uh, really would like it if you know, we'd use the leash uh, with just like, you know, a standard slip call or something. And then, you know, someone else in the family might be, you know, kid or wife or whoever, grandma, grandpa, you know, whatever. They're just like, hey, uh, actually, we only want to use the harness. Now, that's all fine and dandy, except uh, the majority of harnesses, unless they were specifically designed for not pulling, are actually what dogs wear to pull stuff. So a dog that's pulling a cart, a dog that's pulling a sleigh, they wear harnesses, right? Because they're trying to take the pressure off the trachea, put it on the chest so it's easier for them to pull. So if you're trying to stop your dog from pulling, could you do it with a harness? Yes. Is that probably one of the hardest ways to try to stop a dog from leash pulling? Uh, 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 yes. So, you know, when it comes to leash corrections, that is. Now, if you're not doing leash corrections and you're just using food, well, then it doesn't matter what device really they have on. It should make not a whole lot of difference uh, if you get what I'm saying here. So what I really want everyone to understand is if you would simply just time your dog being calm, they will start being calmer more of the time. So one of the easiest strategies that I use is letting that dog out of the crate. So when I let the dog out of the crate, every time they get too excited and try to get out, I just shut it again. 
And if I go to reach for it, even they get too excited, I just back away, go do something else. Now, this doesn't work for dogs that are going to pee their pants, right? If they're going to have an accident, no, this is a bad strategy. But after they've went to the bathroom outside, you can always put them back in the kennel. You can practice this and then create awesome results. How do I know? Because well, I've done it and thousands of others now who have worked with me have done it. And it's just amazing what it actually does. So again, open, shut, open, shut. Finally, I'm opening that thing and they're nice and calm. Out they come already. I've created the foundation of, hey, calm gets you what you want. It's another way to do it, in and out the doors. Well, hey, door opens, you can't run out. You got to be calm here. Let's shut that door, just like the kennel trick, right? Uh, what's another way to do it? Well, think about this. Uh, if you have the back tie, and this is what Scott recommended for the jump in, he was like, look, Jeff, oftentimes it only takes like 10 reps. He was like, we just come in and the dog goes to jump. We walk away. We come in, dog goes to jump. We walk away. It's like about 10 times in, you know, sure enough, that dog would just sit there calmly. We'll give it a treat. We'll do that for a while. So, could you do that at the end of the game and forgo everything else I said and create amazing results? Yes. So right at the end of the game, you can just leash that dog, back tie it to something, and do the Scott trick. <laughs> and I love that Scott trick. Boy, is that a good one. So uh, that's some of the awesomeness you can uh, grab uh, when you become a member of Canine Connect 360. If you're interested in that, check out askjtdt.com forward slash capital CC 360. And the JTDT, in case you haven't figured it out, my name's Jeff. I'm a dog trainer, and that's Jeff the dog trainer. You could probably read that faintly over in the logo there somewhere. Uh, but boys and girls, I have a very exciting call I'm about to make uh, with one of my mentors and absolute angels in an earth suit. Uh, she is uh, amazing, and I, I'm super thrilled to talk to her. So I don't want to stay forever, but hello, Jill. I see you there, Jill. How's it going? Hope everything is wonderful your way. And uh, just know, boys and girls, if you have questions, make sure to ask, and I will do my best uh, to answer each and every one of them, including the follow-up questions. All right. Have a good one for now, and hopefully we will talk again real soon. And remember, the fastest way to change your dog's behavior is to change your own. That's right. You said it. You got it. All right. So long.